On this channel, I do my best to cover European spaceflight developments wherever possible simply because these sorts of stories tend not to attract a great deal of attention in spaceflight media overall. And there's a company called the Exploration Company, not particularly inventive, but still, who are coming out with a European version of the Crew Dragon. Or to be more specific, a European version of the Dragon that will ultimately be be followed up by a crew dragon, but still quite a breakthrough. 100% reusable, well, about the same level of reusability as SpaceX has right now, but with the capability of going to the moon as well as low Earth orbit, and that is a very big breakthrough. And not only that, this company is also looking at establishing a fleet of vehicles, not just the Nix. But unfortunately, I've got some bad news to go with today's good news, and that also involves the European Space Agency, or some satellites that they recently put up, and it's called the Swarm, a group of satellites that were designed to study Earth's magnetic field. And it's not the mission that was problematic, but rather the fact that one of these satellites barely avoided a piece of space debris, and had to carry out a frenzied series of maneuvers in low Earth orbit in order to avoid catastrophe. Now, it's important to note that these are active satellites, satellites that were designed specifically to avoid collisions with space debris, and yet the warning that they got was so short and so urgent that they barely avoided a collision that would have created many hundreds, if not thousands, of pieces of space debris in low Earth orbit, and also quite possibly could have damaged the other two satellites in the constellation that we're following at a very close proximity. So here's the question that I've been asking quite a lot since I started my channel. How long are we going to be able to keep this up? Once again, we're talking about satellites that were designed to avoid collisions, and yet they encountered all of these problems nonetheless. How long are we going to be able to avoid disaster before that disaster actually transpires. Well, we're going to find all of that out in just a moment. Now, the purpose of the Swarm Constellation is to study something that a lot of us might think that we have completely mastered by this point, and that is the nature of our magnetic field, the huge bubble that protects us from cosmic radiation and charged particles that bombard Earth and solar winds. However, one thing that's very unusual about our magnetic field, and probably the magnetic fields of other planets as well, is the fact that it's in a permanent state of flux. Magnetic North wanders, and every few hundred thousand years, the polarity of the magnetic field flips so that a compass would point south instead of north. On top of that, the strength of the magnetic field is constantly changing and is currently showing signs of significant weakening. These sorts of developments are things that need to be studied in depth, which is one of the purposes of the Swarm Constellation. Now, these three identical satellites are equipped with some of the most advanced next-generation sensing equipment that Europe and Canada have to offer, including what's called the Vector Field Magnetometer, which is the mission's core instrument. It makes high-precision measurements of the magnitude and direction of the magnetic field. Its latest generation of instruments was developed and manufactured at the Technical University of Denmark. On top of that, it also has instruments 
instruments that measure the strength of the magnetic field to a greater degree of accuracy than any instrument that's been deployed in orbit before. On top of that, it also has sensors that measure the satellite's non-gravitational acceleration in its respective orbit and, in turn, provides information about air drag and the solar wind. Those instruments were designed and manufactured by the Czech Republic. And it also has an electrical field instrument positioned at the front of each satellite, which measures plasma density, drift, and acceleration in high resolution to characterize the electric field around Earth. And this was developed in Canada, and it also includes a probe that provides measurements of electron density, electron temperature, and the electric potential of the satellite. And that portion of it was developed in Sweden. And on top of that, you also have precise orbit determination from the GPS receivers that were built into the satellite, these having been designed in Austria and also equipped with a laser retro reflector developed by the German GFZ Research Center for Geosciences to validate the GPS system. A hell of a lot of international cooperation went into the creation of these satellites. They contain no moving parts whatsoever except for the boom, and once the boom is deployed, which all of them have been at this point, then there are no moving parts at all. This ensures that no vibrations could influence the measurements being made by the instruments. Also, the solar panels are fixed, forming what's called a satellite roof. Also, magnetic cleanliness is very important, so you have the sensitive instruments mounted at the end of the boom, far away from any magnetic disturbance that the electrical units on the body may cause. Now, these satellites were launched into orbit way back in 2013 by the Russians on an SS-19 intercontinental ballistic missile, or a converted one, and they've been providing invaluable data ever since. And as I said, they were designed specifically to avoid space debris, the Europeans being very focused on that particular issue. And yet, just a few weeks ago, a near catastrophe happened with this constellation. It was an unidentified piece of space junk that was picked up less than 24 hours before the time of collision. And there were a lot of other complicating factors that made the evasion maneuver even more difficult. Unfortunately, at that particular time, the sun was moving into an active part of its 11-year cycle when more and more powerful solar flares were bombarding Earth's upper atmosphere. This increases the density where the satellites orbit, slowing them down, burning more fuel, and threatening to drag them back to the surface. So the ESA was already performing maneuvers with these satellites designed to avoid that kind of fate and maneuver the satellites further up up into low Earth orbit. However, with only eight hours worth of notice, it was determined that the Alpha satellite of the constellation was now on a collision course with a heretofore unidentified piece of space debris, and a very short amount of time remained in order to make yet another adjustment in the satellite's course to avoid a collision and the destruction of the satellite. Once again, although this is not a huge satellite, it wasn't really all that small either, and a full-fledged collision at this speed and trajectory would create quite a cloud of space debris that might very well have threatened the other two satellites in the constellation to say nothing of other satellites that were also trying to maneuver to avoid complications being caused by the solar storms. So all of this, again, could have created a chain reaction in low Earth orbit, a chain reaction that's been warned about time and again on my channel and elsewhere, the Kessler Syndrome, a chain reaction that would destroy virtually every satellite in low Earth orbit and create so much space debris in low Earth orbit that it would be virtually impossible to launch anything into space in the future, including Artemis, including Starship, including anything, until we came up with a comprehensive solution to remove everything from orbit 
it, which would be very complicated indeed. It might seal off our access to space for half a century or longer. And not only that, take out an incredibly important part of our telecommunications and navigation system in space, which would probably put our economy into a free fall and, oh yeah, create clouds and clouds of space debris descending from low Earth orbit, burning up in the atmosphere and making a what recently happened with the Chinese Long March rocket look like a tiny little firework compared to what would happen in the aftermath of the Kessler Syndrome. And once again, let me emphasize, this is not science fiction. This is not alarmist talk. This is a real thing that could very well happen sometime in the near future, and some people argue that in the aftermath of the recent Russian test of an anti-sat weapon, it's already in process, especially given that we're about to introduce thousands and thousands of additional satellites, Starlink and otherwise, into an already crowded space. And these satellites, although they are also designed to avoid collisions, are going to have a very difficult time contending with solar storms and the complications that those present combined with the space debris that we have identified in orbit and more importantly, the huge amount of space debris that we haven't identified in orbit. And what really pisses me off is the fact that events like this barely make the news. Yes, if you pull it up online, you can find it in space.com or Digital Trends or Universe Today or some other sources, but to find it in the mainstream media is challenging indeed, and that's where it belongs. It is this serious. It's something that we should be investing a lot of money in fixing, and yes, there are solutions to this problem, solutions that are a lot easier to implement if we get started before a Kessler syndrome as opposed to trying to solve the problem after a Kessler syndrome. It frustrates the hell out of me that this continues to be a problem, that it continues to be largely ignored, and most importantly, that all of our ambitions in orbit and elsewhere are being put at risk, at serious risk, by this problem until we do something very aggressive to stop it. And thus far, there really isn't enough effort being put into this. The ESA, and especially the United Kingdom, is investing some money in it, much more than the United States, but nevertheless, it's not nearly enough to solve the problem. Will we get lucky for a long enough period of time until we finally do get serious about the issue? Generally, if we're talking about human behavior, I kinda doubt it. Okay, let's start talking about something positive now. At long last, the ESA seems to be catching up with NASA when it comes to privatizing spaceflight, which is an important development to keep Europe competitive in the world of spaceflight, especially human-rated spaceflight. And I've been saying for quite some time that really Europe should consider just using Dream Chaser to advance their ambitions of putting human beings into space on their own, but now it would appear that the exploration company is trying to do something different with a spacecraft called the Nyx, which is the Greek goddess of night. Now, this vessel is very similar to Crew Dragon in many respects, hopefully not that similar to Starliner. Now, initially, Nyx is designed to be a cargo vessel intended to carry four metric tons up to low Earth orbit, but also capable of carrying out a wide variety of scientific experiments in microgravity, kind of a mini space station on its own. In addition, it has full reusability. The trunk is not reusable, but that's kind of the case with Cargo Dragon as well. But it does have a high degree of reusability and also a lot of flexibility. It can go up on an Ariane 6 or an Ariane 5. It can also go up on a Falcon 9 or a Falcon Heavy. It has a wide variety of different launch providers that can haul this thing to various destinations. But here's what's really cool about the Nix. It's designed to carry 1.6 metric tons all the way out to the Lunar Gateway or 1.2 metric tons to the Lunar Gateway and then 
300 kilograms back to Earth. Now, this is a capability that sets Nix apart from all of its competitors. The Dragon XL, designed to carry cargo out to the Lunar Gateway, cannot bring samples back from the space station and land it on Earth nor can the shooting star module from the Dream Chaser, which is also intended for use with Lunar Gateway resupply, which means this is a vehicle that could carry out two separate distinct missions to the Lunar Gateway in a single flight, something that could make it very, very useful. On top of that, this vehicle is also capable of lunar landings, 500 kilograms to the lunar surface, and then 100 kilograms back to Earth if desired. Lots and lots of amazing capabilities of this vehicle. Now, its first test flight is due to take place in 2024, with its maiden flight, its first mission, taking place in 2026. So, just around the corner, and also very much in conjunction with when the Lunar Gateway is supposed to become operational. Now, as I said before, the Nix bears a great deal of resemblance to the Dragon, including a heat shield, parachutes, that sort of thing, but on top of that, it also has solar panels built into the structure rather than solar panels that are extended out from the vessel, so a little bit different there. Also, its landing legs makes it very, very different from any of the versions of Dragon that currently exist, once again, giving it this unique capability of sending cargo to the moon. Now, this could include little rovers and that sort of thing, but if you're talking about 500 kilograms worth of cargo, that's actually a hell of a lot, especially for only four astronauts or so. That would be a lot of supplies that theoretically could be sent to the surface of the moon without any sort of complications involved with docking with the gateway first, that sort of thing. So this provides a logistical level of sophistication to the Artemis mission missions that a lot of other vehicles are not providing right now, giving the European Space Agency and the Exploration Company a leg up when we're talking about the bleeding edge of lunar exploration. And on top of all of this, the Exploration Company intends to make this vehicle human-rated in the future and also to utilize low Earth orbit refueling or refueling in cis lunar space to extend its cargo and crew carrying capacity. So lots and lots of new developments coming for this vehicle on top of the impressive things that it already is designed to do. I can't wait to see what's coming next from this company and once again, it can fly on a wide variety of rockets, including Rocket Lab's Neutron. So how about that for an interesting mission, by the way? A European mission going up on a European cargo vessel or a European crew rated vessel being launched by a New Zealand rocket. That would totally change the nature of spaceflight on our planet. Very exciting stuff indeed. And as you can see, the Europeans are finally embracing private space flight jumping into this industry with both feet and it's about time in addition, guys, please keep in mind that I'm going to be traveling to Cape Canaveral here in the next few weeks to cover Artemis 1. I would certainly appreciate any sort of support that you folks might be willing to provide once again to emphasize it's not your responsibility to pay my bills, but nevertheless, any help that I can receive would be deeply, deeply appreciated. Once again, everything in the description will tell you how to go about doing that if you'd like to support support my future content. Also, please like and please subscribe. That alone would be deeply appreciated. So until the privatization of European space flight allows them to catapult their own astronauts out into space as aggressively as NASA is doing right now, I urge all of you to stay angry about space.